Okay, well, you see the title there and a very pretty cross-section out in the Great Basin sedimentary sequence that we realize is hot. When Sid Green and I got together right at the start of trying to put together a program, trying to think through what would be the various session themes, Sid was adamant saying, these first two talks this afternoon have got to paint the picture for everyone about what sort of basin characteristics we need to have a viable geothermal energy power plant. Got to make that linkage, the subsurface, the surface, what are we all looking at, and conceptually get everyone on the same page. And obviously as we go through the subsequent sessions, we'll flesh out a lot of nuances and so forth with that. So I'm coming at it from a geothermal energy perspective. That's, I've dabbled off and on through my career in the high temperature side of things. And having looked at, with a project with Joe, screening a lot of basins to see whether it looks like you could make a go of stratigraphic reservoirs in hot basins and convince the future here in the US in terms of growth in the next 10 years is probably going to come from that type of uh, reservoir system, geothermal reservoir system, rather than from EGS or conventional hydrothermal, which a lot of the easy ones have been found. Second talk, Kate, is going to come from a petroleum perspective. We haven't communicated, and that's probably a good thing. So it'll be very interesting to see at the end of our two talks whether there's some areas of overlap there or we're miles apart. And it doesn't matter which way it is, it's going to be good fodder for the rest of the conference. So let me, where are we here? Okay. Okay, let's get on to more serious stuff. The two ends of the spectrum, most geothermal developments around the world, if you add up gigawatts, come from hydrothermal systems. That's where the temp high temperatures have been brought up close to the surface, the ground surface, through convection, whether it be faults or a combination with magmatic injections, volcanoes, whatever. But the high temperatures have, have been an easy drillable target. There's permeability there with fractures, faulting, whatever. And that's the conventional type of system. The thing we've been after for decades, actually, three or four decades, where we have the technology, theoretically, to just go into any rock that's hot enough, frack it, hydrofrack it, create a reservoir network of, uh, through, through fractures or whatever, and then start circulating water, cold water and injectors, flows through the cracks and up and out as hot water. This one has proved, I think, the reality is after sort of at least 30 years in, in different countries trying projects, being a real tough nut to crack. And I just mentioned before I leave this slide, probably the best manual on a lot of geothermal characteristics is still Jeff Tester and a lot of other authors in there. That 2006 report, I find I often go back there if you want a summary of sort of stuff, properties, whatever. That's still a great report. So the challenge that we have, and focus on this graph first here on the left, the, the reality we have is the geothermal, these red triangles, and here it's gigawatt hours. So we've taken out of the, the load factor, the, the wind only blows a third of the time, the sun only shines half the day if there's no clouds. If you just look at gigawatts being generated, and this is the US I'm talking about, geothermal's been on a plateau here. It's shown a bit of growth with the ARA spending the last few years. But by solar and wind standards, it's poor. Wind's taking off at 10% a year growth at least. Solar as well, coming from a much lower base. A lot of it's solar PV. And in fact, the 213 numbers I looked up on EIA for the first six months of this year, both solar and wind showing this 10% growth, geothermal was flat, zero, zero growth. And so we. I think have an issue here and in my opinion have to ask ourselves whether we still should put a lot of investment into EGS because we're able to generate megawatt scale type systems at the moment but if we're looking 
for credibility in geothermal, we need to be thinking hundreds of megawatts in terms of potential developments to get the growth we want. This amounts in the US to three to three and a half gigawatts. You can look in your handout, the glossy, the elephant volume, says by 2020, maybe seven gigawatts. Well, for the, the last 15, 20 years, we've been stuck on three, so doubling is clearly a big challenge the way we're going unless there's some big breakthrough. Now, if you look over on the right, I've pulled off the most recent example, and this could be fair or unfair on the Newbury project, but I've just published in the GRC two or three weeks ago at the conference the injectivity from their well, and they have some issues with it, but in the units they use, litres per second per unit pressure, so injectivity is the ratio of the sort of flow you can get either coming out of the well, productivity, or pumping into the well, injectivity. It's a measure of how productive the well is per unit of pressure change. And they have units there one to two meters per second per megapascal. If you look in the hydrothermal literature for what constitutes a good well, in fact, a variety of modest wells to excellent wells, that lower graph on the right, in the same units. And good wells have injectivities of 50 to 100 litres per second per MPA. 50 times bigger than what we're getting up here. And that's a crucial issue, I think. The technology for creating reservoir scale permeability using hydrofractor, hydrofracking techniques is just not there at the moment. And maybe if we look at stratigraphic reservoirs that are hot enough, where the natural permeability is already there, and that's a big ask, we're going to quantify this in a minute, we've got a head start. Find where the natural permeability is, and if necessary, maybe enhance that in tight bits. We've got a much, much better chance of having the productivity that we want. Just so everyone's on the same page then, We've got to be thinking 100 megawatt scale developments, power developments, if geothermal is going to have a significant impact in the renewables looking forward in the next decade or two. So that's the first thing. The other thing here, once we start thinking of stratigraphic reservoirs, and a very simple setup here, closed system up at the surface, all the water that's produced goes through as an injected. We're talking about sub-horizontal reservoirs in contrast to the traditional hydrothermal systems where there's plumes of water and fault control, they're sub-vertical till you get to an outflow zone and then that flows off. But the main production reservoir there typically is sub-vertical or equidimensional. We start looking at stratigraphic reservoirs with sub-horizontal. That's an important concept. The other thing is they're not new. Others around the world have looked at them, Paris Basin for direct heat. Uh, there's been developments in Australia looking at this sort of thing. So they're not new, but here in the US, we've sort of gone for the end game on EGS and perhaps overlooked the opportunity that's sitting here. So the questions here to answer Sid's question, what is it going to look like if we're thinking of this? How big, what characteristics do we need down there? Nearly like a, in the middle of a basin, you've got horizontal layers. So instead of vertical structures, it's what's intriguing about this map. And I know we have uh, heat flow specialists here, and in fact, it's Dave Blackwell's group that puts a great map, put this together. But, but maybe recognizing this is arguable, and we can maybe chat tonight over a glass of wine. The area of high heat flow here, especially this area here, it's about half the 10 to the 6 square kilometers here, could be the largest area on land of high heat flow, 80 milliwatts per square meter, of anywhere. And the reason I say that is a lot of the high temperature resources, hydrothermal, are uh, pockmarked along and andesite arcs. Um, I always cut my geothermal teeth in the TVZ and there are a gigawatt of power there, but it's the same size as Yellowstone. So that's how big that is. The Rheingraben, where Lazi comes from, is about half the size. It's narrower than what it's shown here for the Snake River Plain. This is massive area we've got sitting here. 
Less than 500 megawatts of plants, all focused on traditional, virtually all on traditional hydrothermal type systems. And yet this area has a lot of uh, basins, basin filled, quaternary through the, the mechanism of stretching the crust there, on so tertiary quaternary fill on top of Paleozoics in a lot of places. Uh, we have the sort of sedimentary basins that may have a lot of potential if we're prepared to drill a little deeper than what we've done. In the project I've been involved with with Joe, whoops, sorry, with Joe, uh, screening, looking around, there's other big basins shown here, the Piants is situated in here across the Utah-Colorado border. This corner of it is actually very hot and in fact Mobile drilled a well and the hottest well in Colorado, 200, it went to 240C, but down at 5.5 Ks, but had fantastic permeability at the bottom in the lead bull carbonate. Um, there's uh, another on this side of the Rockies through here is the Denver Julesburg Basin, and this corner of it looks like it's sitting on pretty hot. It's the margin of this Colorado's Rockies heat flow high, is also hot. And then at the GRC, uh, John Whelan from the Idaho survey pointed out the central thrust belt, which cuts just very close to us, right up through this area here, curves into Wyoming, and then cuts into the Snake River Plain. There's a, a highly, been a lot of wells drilled here for oil in this thrust belt. There are wells there with more than 200 Celsius, down about three kilometers. So there's another area outside of traditional Great Basin, the extensional basins that we've been looking at. There are opportunities, these stars that were found, and there'll be a lot more within the, ba within the Great Basin, where we may have the characteristics we want, close to 200 C, three to four kilometers. This figure came out in Earth Science Reviews. It was targeted for, I don't know, people wanting to understand the different types of oil resources. And I found it useful, again, visually, to contrast what we're talking about here with hot stratigraphic reservoirs versus traditional oil and gas or the, the new source rock oil and gas, tight oil, shale oil, shale gas, tight gas. The traditional oil reservoirs, we're looking at some sort of a trap and pretty good permeability. That's the nature of easy to pull the oil out or push it out with secondary recovery, pushing water in. The, tight, uh, the, the change in the technology for horizontal drilling and hydrofracking has meant these source rocks that are here in the red and the what, gray color and through here volumetrically extensive but low permeability and what we're looking for sitting underneath there conveniently they shaded it as carbonate could be sandstones in there too a high permeability but the resource the heat is geographically extensive the heat's the matrix of water so in terms of resource distribution, there's similarities to the, to the tight, the source rocks, but we're looking for permeabilities that high according to the traditional oil and gas. So can we find the permeabilities we need at the sufficient temperatures and at a drillable depth? And the first question we need to ask, and okay, we're thinking 100 megawatt increments, power station, just how much reservoir rock do we need to keep that going for 30 years? That's an interesting exercise, pretty simple to do. Students could, should be able to do it on the back of an envelope pretty quickly. And here, just say, right, let's assume 200 C, that's what we're trying to get at, for the production well, through the power plant, we cool it down, take the heat out, binary fluid, generate the power, and put it in, the re-inject re it at 75 C. Reasonable numbers, so that's the delta T, for the work of pulling the water from production to injection and then cross flow. And for this, these sort of temperatures, let's say the conversion efficiency, it's a little bit optimistic, but 20% up here is the conversion efficiency from heat to power in the plant. So how, how big is this volume down here? And really this is a key factor that's got to come back in the next few days as we're talking. It depends on the heat sweep efficiently, the efficiency. And the question is, well, what is that path? 
and various people have had a go at trying to quantify it. Way back in the late 70s, Pat, Pat Muffler and USGS colleagues said, oh, well, let's assume 25% for this heat sweet efficiency. 25% of the heat that's down there potentially can be mined. Others, and those of us who are familiar with the geothermal community more recently, some familiar names here, have taken another look at naturally fractured reservoirs and said, no, this looks to be too high. We've got to lower our targets, maybe 5 to 15% is more realistic. And then they've also said, looked at some EGS projects, I think one of the Australian ones, and the SALT project in France, and said, wow, it's, in those EGS projects, it's down to a few percent. So the number that you assume here determines the volume that we're getting at. So if you take 10% as a ballpark in the middle of this 5 to 15, the volume we're looking at, 30 years, 100 megawatts power, 20% conversion efficiency, 16 cubic kilometers. And that's the challenge we've got with EGS. That, for EGS, is a massive volume to create. Even with today's technologies of hydrofracking and so forth, that's a big number. And Exactly. We're being optimistic here. You're starting with EGS with low perm and trying to create the whole thing. Let's focus where there's some natural permeability. And in fact, because initially, we're trying to cherry pick and take the creme de la creme of projects of where we may be able to prove this can work and given the current economics and gas prices keeping energy costs down if we've we got very per permeable rocks and decent porosity maybe we can push this, this up to 20 percent and that's the number to remember to work with could be a minimum but 10 cubic kilometers so again because of the sub horizontal reservoir Let's say the, the sort of our reservoir sequence, and it could be reservoir seal, reservoir seal, 1,000 feet, 300 meters thick, that package is, ends up being our drilling target. 30 square kilometers is the footprint. Five by six square kilometers, which is, can be a sort of an oil field size. That number is actually not that big when you start thinking, well, if you can prove it in this part of the basin, and stratigraphic, just work your way up the basin and quickly uh, you can end up with a very large number. So 10 cubic kilometres, 30 square kilometres footprint. Right, how big are these wells? It's a crucial thing. A controlled well, another one that we know all about in the Gulf of Mexico, an uncontrolled well. Good, excellent well. Both these have similar mass flow. The units up there, mass flow units, can drive you nuts depending on if you're reading papers from Europe or they're using litres and kilograms. Down under they use tonnes per hour. The oil industry uses bar barrels per day. If you're dealing with pump flows, groundwater, and all oh, this, it's gallons per minute. Anyway, there's all the conversion factors. A good well, 5 to 10 megawatts, is, produces this sort of mass or volume flux. Both about the same, but look at the difference in value. $100 a barrel times this number, 5 million a day is the value of what's pouring out here. And note the enthalpy has a lot higher enthalpy oil than hot water, which could be 1.2, 1.3. It's the order of 1 megajoule, a lot less, $25,000 per day of power value. And that's the nub of it. Geothermal is the poor cousin of the oil and gas industry, particularly the oil industry at the moment. So we have to be economically realistic that we can't just drill a six kilometre well to get the temperature we want. It's probably going to be too expensive. So large flows, this is a very large flow by oil industry standards, 50,000. It doesn't have to be that large, but we probably do need for good wells up to about 30,000 barrels per day of hot water. So we're at the high end of what's feasible. It'll be interesting to see how, what others think. But I want to know, so that was 50,000 barrels a day we're looking at. What's being done at the moment in the oil patch and how much might that be relevant when we start thinking of the geothermal situation? Well, with these source rocks, very low perm, they're drilling down to whatever the appropriate depth. In this case, the Barkin up in North Dakota, they've put a lot of information online. This guy, Bruce Hicks, who's on the regulatory agency, really interesting to look because there's big economic impacts, there's big societal impacts of what's going on up there with all the drilling. Um, 
They're typically getting initial productions, 1,000 barrels a day. Down in the Eagle Foot in Texas, they boast they get twice that, 2,000 barrels a day. I know in the Uinta Basin, when they're drilling shale oil targets, it's about 1,500. And they all have this, which surprised me, the type of curve response over time. There's years on the bottom here. Um, but even despite this, down at 1,000 barrels a day initial, and after two or three years, they're down to a tenth of that. You look at the economics that are here. 30 year well life, um, forget the dollar sign there, half a million barrels of oil, $9 million to complete these, drill and complete these wells. Now these wells up in the back and they're drilling 8 to 10,000 feet vertical and then going 8 to 10,000 feet horizontal. 5 to 6 kilometers or 16 to 20,000 foot of total drilling depth. And Will Gosnold was telling me they're now doing them 20 days to drill these wells, two days to frack. And of course, with this sort of profile, they've got to keep drilling. They're on a, to keep the profits going, they've got to drill a lot of wells. For geothermal, remember we're wanting 30,000 to 50,000 and we want the production sustained for 30 years. Flat, way up, a story up, across and keeping flat. So, are there some things we could learn here? Can the technology be adapted? Here they're trying to keep the hydrofracks within zone, within the source rock, whereas we're looking for reservoir seal, reservoir seal, and trying to connect some of these. So the, the direct comparison may not be relevant. There may be ways this technology can get into geothermal to help us. Now, Another reality here, for geothermal, everything we produce has got to be injected, so we're actually dealing with two wells. We need to, water's precious, particularly out here in the west, so we can't just discharge it. We also need to keep pressure in the reservoir. There are issues in juice seismicity and things like that that we'll get onto. So if we're producing, we're injecting, and that's keeping the pressure drive, pushing the fluids, the hot fluids across, cold water's following, getting heated by the rock. So we have reasonable pressure balance. So the two big constraints we've got are shown here. If we drilled, thinking of conducting gradients, we could drill deeper to get the temperature we want, but the costs start spiraling. And this seems to, we've chosen, we've done some modeling on this, so this is why we have the data. These are the curves we've been using at the moment. So we know, I'm sort of, we know we want to get into this window, and I'll reinforce this later on. You know, it's six or seven million dollars if it's a standard, and then it's starting to go get, get exponential and get really expensive. So we can't go too deep or we're gonna hurt the economics. We also can't go too shallow. You can come up shallow and say, oh, we'll find the permeability up here, but it's gonna be cooler up there, and you get penalized by second law of thermodynamics. The amount of heat you can get out at, say, 200 degrees C for a temperature increment compared to 100 degrees C, and thinking what you can get in a power plant, diminishes dramatically, a factor of three, lower. So you need three times more mass, and it's a bit like the treadmill. You need to drill more wells. So if it's too cool, you come up too shallow, or the heat flow is too low, you're also going to have an uneconomic project. And there's another constraint down here that uh, is pumps. Typically, for, if we're thinking of the temperatures getting up close to 200, pumps stoned with a maximum technological limit is 200 degrees C. Of course, if you've got electronics downhole, submersible, you probably maximum is 150 C, but more common, the line shaft pumps, there are limits there because they can't take a given amount of torque. They're limited to about 2,000 feet. You can seat them. You might want to sit them greater. There is a, a little glimmer of height. There was a paper at the GRC a few weeks back on a turbine, a new style of pump, no electronics downhole, type of turbine that looks exciting and may get us away from that limit. So we painted ourselves into a bit of a box here, which is how this figure that's on the front of your covers got derived. So most of our traditional geothermal is up here where there's been convection that's brought the high temperatures up, and you can see a variety of style of 
geothermal target across here, the temperature of the units of your choice that are sitting up there. What we're saying, and you've got traditional oil and gas, some geotherms here, 50, 70, 90, just taking typical thermal conductivity profiles for basins. Traditional petroleum reservoirs, typically in this zone here, they tank, can drill deeper, you get into higher pressures, over pressures in basins, and there is, I've noticed in World Oil Magazine, been papers recently on what they call, the petroleum industry calls, high pressure, high temperature systems, particularly in the Gulf, overpressured down here at this depth. The box that we're looking at actually sits in here, the bright red, and based on today's economics, three to four kilometers, and getting up close to that 200 limit. There could easily be a gap here, as I was mentioning, through pumps. These wells get to be very poor discharging, self-discharging. They work great up in this range. As you get to 200, they don't tend to discharge very effectively. It flows you want. And it take, you've got to get down here for the pumps. So we have this shut off at the moment. If economics improve, then you might be able to expand the box into lower heat flow areas. But just We've done economic modeling and I'm not going to go into it, but this is the shape of the levelized cost of electricity curves. Um, and it will apply actually whether you're dealing with moderate temperature systems up here or these stratigraphic reservoirs. If you're trying to stay close to 10 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, then for flow rates in here, and the maximum flow you'll get out of a pump is 2,000. So somewhere in the 1,000 to 2,000. The lower the flow that you're able to pump usually means it's a proxy for permeability because you can only tolerate a given amount of drawdown before you've got trouble. So if there's lower permeability, you can't get the flows you want. So you need these sort of flow rates to minimize the number of wells, again thinking 100 megawatt power plants. And then the rate of rundown, and this ties into the heat sweep. If you're getting short circuiting, you're going to run down at too high a rate, and again, you need replacement wells. 1% per year would drop 200 degrees in 30 years to about 150 C. So we want to be in that range as well. Okay, another thing that the geothermal people will know, but those of you who haven't thought about it might not, is the heat in the matrix or in the water. Well, the sort of things we're looking at uh, nice poor perm characteristics, let's say maybe about 10%, the heat is actually in the matrix. But the working fluid is obviously the poor fluid. But we've got to get that heat out of the matrix. Just getting the water out in the short circuit isn't going to get you very far. You're going to leave most of the heat behind. So we've got to sweep the heat, which means distributed permeability. This shows it very clearly, a four to one ratio between what's in the matrix versus what's in the water at 10%. Got that. Then again, so what poor perm characteristics? So I've got two slides on this. One is starting with the global data set that Berenberg and Nadal published a few years back, 2005. They've, they had 35,000 pieces of data on porosity with depth and the classic log permeability versus porosity. Massive data set, big cloud of it, and this is simplified here. So let me just explain the lines first. So if we take, say, the P90, this curve here, this means that 90% of the data, the porosity data, with the various depths, lies at greater than this curve. The P10 means 10% of the data lies at greater than that. And then the median curve is the solid line. Same for the, for the uh, siliciclastics. Forget the black dash line for the moment. So three to four kilometers is what we're in. In the global data set, if you can trust this, and you're saying, right, we're going to want the best, so we're going to be in above the P50. We've got two zones here that we're looking at, and maybe 10 to 15% is not is a reasonable value for carbonates, maybe a bit higher, 15 to 25 for the siliciclastics, if you're above P50. If you shift those porosities down, recognizing there's a sort of linear relationship between the log of permeability and porosity, 
So the higher porosities will translate into the higher permeabilities. They lie in this, within Cooey, of this 100 millidarcy level. There's a lot of data at the 100 millidarcy level, which is actually what we're, we need. Now, the one fly in the ointment, so to speak, with this, and they only have a sentence or two in their paper. They point out one profile from uh, the Norwegian North Sea, where there's a higher gradient, 35 degrees per kilometer, has a totally different trend for siliciclastic to the global trend. And they say, well, hang on, we're getting higher temperatures here. Down at four kilometers, you'd be up to 140C, 150C and you're losing a lot of the porosity and presumably the permeability may have to worry about diagenesis and temperature which is important for us because we're looking at potentially up to 200 C so bear that in mind Stefan here who's attending us has gone through as part of our study um, screening all the data in the Great Basin and the Rockies oil well data and all the groundwater data bases against four rock types shown here. Basin fill, the yellowy symbols, of course that's all up shallow, We've got depth here in, in meters. The yellow zone is our three to four target. Igneous rocks, which the oil industry doesn't tend to like drilling a long, long way through them, so the data set tends to be a bit shallower on them, but these smaller symbols, reddish, what's interesting about that is you look at the trend here and there's a definite as you go with depth, a degradation of permeability in igneous, which is igneous or volcanic, crystalline, intrusive or volcanic. Uh, and that's highlighting if you've got mixed mineralogies in your rock, maybe that's the worst possible case in terms of preserving reservoir quality. And the oil patch has probably known that for decades. So we come back to these carbonates and siliclastics. Of course, it would be great to know more about whether they're dolomites or limestones and how clean they are. But in the three to five kilometer range for the data that's sitting in here, Stefan calculated the means for the carbonate 75 millidarcies. Siliciclastics are roughly half what the carbonates are. Why is there this difference to the global data set? Short answer is I'm not sure, but I suspect it's to do with this diagenesis effect and we may have either present day or past thermal history in these deeper basins, especially the Rockies, that have degraded uh, siliciclastic permeability relative to carbonates. No, there's from drill stem tests, from pump tests. Yeah, Stefan, the source of the data? Yeah. Yeah, so they're a step closer to reality and that's always the trouble. You do your measurements on the lab, but scaling it up is a nightmare because you're missing faults and stuff. Oops, that was bad news. I wonder, there we go. One button out. Uh, now I'm getting myself into trouble here. Have we got to start again to start it. hit the view? Now, let's see if I can do that. They could be. Let's just do it by manually just to keep the show on the right here. So I've got just two or three slides, three, four slides, and then I'm, I'm going to finish here. We've done some reservoir modeling here, and I think this is, to me, the most revealing, and, and the messages that come out of this are, are really important. And what we've done, this is plan view, said let's take the oil industry file, five spot configuration, every, uh, well, he's got a, every, every injector surrounded by four producers, every producer sounds the nearest wells of four injectors. Used secondary recovery of oil, standard, we working? Good. Bad. Good. Um, and we can model the smallest increment that we can just fold across the basin is the dashed area there, the 500 meter spacing. We experimented a little, we had spacing larger initially, settled on 500 because it, it's just differentiated nicely the responses of different permeability regimes. 
And what we said, let's go down, this is centered at three kilometers. We got a gradient 35 degrees C per kilometer from the surface, which is a way, way up higher. One milladarcy for the blue, and in most of the models, 100 milladarcies for these red being 25 meter thick layers where there's great permeability. And these are sort of reservoir seal, reservoir seal type sequence over 300 meters. Hydrostatic, the inject, the uh, producers pumped at 1,000 gallons per minute, 32,000 barrels per day, uh, through the power plant, injecting 75C here and whatever comes out of the producers on this side and let it roll for 50 years. And the different models here said, well, let's bunch all these up into one layer, so exactly the same transmissivity, 10 Darcy meters, 425 meter units at 100 milladarcies. Uh, it gives you the 10 Darcy meters. Bunched up in one layer here, and then we said, right, let's make one of these really high permeability, 300 milladarcies, and the other three lower, so we still have 10 Darcy meters here. So for the, those three, exactly the same transmissivities, and then a low perm one where we just made 30 milladarcy units for the sandwich layer. Um, and the rest I think I've covered there already. Uh, no flow boundaries on the, on the outside so that we're just simulating that can be folded across. Right, so if we figured it out here, and what you're looking at on the next diagram is between an injector and a producer there. But it's symmetric. So visually here, the, the red or orange was our 200 degrees C in the middle there. There tends to be oranges on top and red underneath because we had a gradient through it, 35 degrees C per kilometer. This is after 30 years. And just visually, you can see here, we're starting to get the cooler fluids, some greeny tones coming through. Blue is the injection temperature. After 30 years in the sandwich model, remember this is 500 meters, this is 300 meters here. In the single layer, we're in trouble there. That's our production zone, and blue's broken through there. You can see that's gonna be the worst performer. This one's kind of interesting, again the four layers, this is the 300 milladarcy layer and obviously the water short circuit through there, but our other layers up here are still producing warm, warm, to, warm to hot water. And in terms of the low permeability, uh, that's probably color wise, just qualitatively looks to be the best of all, but there's a penalty there. So there's some messages that come out of this and then I'll show some graphs with this with time to be a little bit more quantitative. There's good high permeability and there's lousy high permeability. And the, the good permeability is obviously when it's dispersed, like we've got here. The lousy permeability, if all your permeability is localized and we put it into here, then the water just went straight through and once the thermal breakthrough had happened, that's it. You're not sweeping the heat out of the rest of the reservoir. And then there's some mixtures there as well. The other thing that sometimes gets forgotten is the conduction length and on a 30 year time frame, and you're thinking reservoir seal, reservoir seal, you can get heat out of the low perm rocks. We could have put zero permeability in those seal layers and a certain thickness because of the 30 year time scale, it will come out and they will cool. cool. Uh, this thermal time constant, uh, you know, cooking an egg, it's a few minutes, cooking a turkey, it's hours. If you're dealing with 30 years, you're dealing with 50 meter thickness where the low perm will be contributing some of its heat through just conduction effects. So, Oh, this thing still failed. Let's, uh... So graphically, just to summarize all this, and what we've done here is scaled it. Obviously temperature was one of the outputs, but if you then scale up looking at the flow rate, the temperature, the converting it at the temperature to the appropriate power, and so we're expressing it as megawatts per square electric, per square kilometer of basin. Look in pan view per square kilometer, two producers, two injectors with the configuration that we've got. Here's the response. 
the, let's look at a sandwich one first, which was sort of our standard thing. For 10 years, took 10 years for the 500 meters to see the breakthrough. And then, of course, it, it, it heads downhill, going over a factor of three. This is 50 years. Drops by a factor of three. 10 megawatts per square kilometer down to about just under three. The low perm model performs the best of all. So it's the same flow rates, but the penalty has been there's 40 bars drawdown in that reservoir compared to something like, this is in the production zone, compared to 15 in the sandwich model. So you've got a penalty there, although it's responding well, you've got to work harder pulling the fluid out because of the lower transmissivity. The, um, the single layer where all the flow is just going through one layer again, it takes a while, it takes the 10 years to break through into your production well, and then it tanks, and you're basically out of business by the time, certainly by 30 years, if not earlier. The short circuit is kind of interesting because that 300 millidarcy layer narrow initially dominates it, it's these purpley colored squares, but then when you actually look at, we can look at the feed zones that are contributing, four feed zones there, there's viscosity effects going on there. The cold water that's broken through in the 300 millidarcy layer, much cold water is about three times, four times as viscous as hot water, and you get a lot of heat coming through the other zones that are compensating for the one zone that's got the short circuiting. So the viscosity effects compensate slightly, and although you've lost a lot of uh, potential heat compared to, say, sandwich, the long term you're hanging in there just because the other layers are contributing. So you've got to be careful on the permeability regime you have, and the more dispersed it is, the better. Oh. Right, second to last slide. Last slide is issues, which John said all speakers have got to have at the end. These two figures, all field figures, uh, different vintages, um, are on the same scale. And this is interesting, and why I put this here is to be thinking, well, what could a future geothermal bore field look like uh, if we're thinking of 100 megawatt power plants uh, when we look back at the oil patch and the technologies that may be relevant. You'll see the core on this on Monday afternoon, Anif, down in southeast Utah, our largest oil field. Uh, you add that up, about uh, 500 million barrels of oil discovered in 56. So there's a whole lot of different technologies here. A lot of 40 acre, five spot pattern, so quarter mile uh, spacing here. They've tried limited horizontal drilling. Nothing compared to what we're going to see in Barkin. They've tried CO2 injection, they've got water flood, you name it, they've done all kinds of things. That's the sort of pattern we're looking at. That's a high permeability reservoir, carbonates, which you'll learn more about on Monday afternoon. Look at this, same scale, North Dakota, the Barkin Shale oil field. So these, these are your um, two mile, so 10,000 foot horizontal sections here, absolutely good drilling through here to try to get the oil out of these sections. So with that in mind, what's the picture that we need for 100 megawatt scale power developments? Probably something like five spot injector producer spacing, 500 meter sort of spacing, which is four wells or 10 wells per square mile, 16 up here, based on our modeling. So we've got reservoir seal units, uh, we definitely need to be 30 to ideally 100 millidarcy permeability in our reservoir units and enough of them in what the oil industry would say cumulative, cumulative pay, adding them up in terms of transmissivity, 3 to 10 darcy meters. Well depths 3 to 4Ks as we're showing. Definitely at least 150, if not 175 to 200. Someone trying to get up there, certainly initially, just for the economics and the power generation. All wells pumped. So 60, there's your units. I won't go through all them. Air-cooled binary plant. Last slide. Issues up on the right-hand side here. So can we find these wells? Can we drill them and get the permeability we need so get the mass flow out of them? Close behind that issue is you need more than just the wells tapping into good permeability. You need a network of it, a reservoir. 
So we're actually, you know, that's where the stratigraphic side of it comes from in terms of what well field strategy we're going to have to disperse the fluids so we're sweeping heat over enough rock volume, that 10 cubic kilometres. I'll just throw in here some other things we've looked at, but the oil industry's got a, very, got a lot of expertise in this area, but we're probably looking in the units I'm thinking of, Paleozoic bedrock units, trying to image, well, where is the best permeability? And seismic reflection attributes down at this depth surely is going to have a lot of help for what we're after. The temperatures I mentioned, there's going to be poor fluid chemistry issues, issues when we look at those deep wells that have been drilled and uh, up in, up in yeah, the Wind River, they uh, produce sour gas, there's CO2, there's some H2S, very clean carbonate. Uh, if you look at that uh, deep well that Mobile drilled in the Piance, uh, again into the Leadville, it has some other gases with it. So poor fluid chemistry, diagenesis, trying to understand that better in the temperature range we're interested in, which is tends to be a bit high for the oil patch, very important. Are carbonates the ideal reservoir? I think they might be. Retrograde solubility for fluids that are saturated with uh, or interacting with carbonates. Pump design, clearly important for the temperature threshold that we're coming up against. We need to be thinking on this 100 megawatt scale. If we're going to get gigawatts of growth here in the US, we've got to be thinking 100 megawatt scale power plants. And it comes down to credibility and showing that this gigawatt potential is here and perhaps is more attainable than EGS, reservoir creation. It's a noble goal, but we're not making enough progress. We need to regain the recognition of the people higher up, particularly the Energy Information, Energy Information Agency, which sometimes doesn't even put geothermal in the renewables. Everyone sees the growth in solar and wind and geothermal's not there. I think we can make a difference with these hot bases. Thank you. Yep. Um, I've done a lot of work looking at reservoir pressures and I, I talked about that actually this morning but everywhere I've looked in the Great Basin it's hydrostatic even down to five kilometers is amazing in the Great Basins which is the area with the highest largest area of high heat flow it's extensional there's faults on all the ranges you only have to go about 50 kilometers laterally into the next range where a lot of your reservoir rocks outcrop and then they go in underneath at three k's and then back up everywhere I've looked and there's a lot of there has been a lot of oil drilling there everything's on hydrostatic to maybe just less than the ground surface. Is, is it hydrostatic at low temperature or hydrostatic at the high temperature? It's hydrostatic, Colin. This is typically with the oil wells, it's lower temperature. So it's just, yeah, when I talk about hydrostatic, it's whatever the conditions are, is the, to looking at the temperature of the fluid, it's sitting there naturally like a column of static water, whether it be hot or cold. Talked about that this morning. There's actually a difference in the pressure gradient between hot water and cold water, and that's actually kind of interesting. When you fill the wells with injection with cold water, geothermal, you can actually work out from pressure pivots as the well heats up about your permeable zone. The other thing I showed this morning, the last slide, if you look in the Rockies at the deepest, the two fields, the five and a half kilometer well that Mobile drilled in the Piants, went through overpressures and oil, gas rich zones, and then into the Leadville and the Devonian carbonates, the pressures were back onto hydrostatic from the surface. Once they got back into their high permeability unit underneath, it wasn't overpressured, somehow or other it's communicating, communicating because of this laterally extensive high permeability in those carbonates with short circuits to the surface. We see it in the Uinta Basin, once you go under the Pennsylvanian, there's an, the, the, actually the Paradox Basin, everywhere you go in the Paradox, the Mississippian sits on one pressure curve that's equilibrating effectively with the Colorado River. Up in the, um, the deep, ultra-deep Burlington Wells and the Wind River Basin, 
Once they got into the 20,000 feet to 25,000 feet again, it was Madison. They had overpressures above. Once they got into the Madison, which is now the producer for that sour gas, the pressures there are on hydrostatic from the surface. So, and that's, a, I think, a sign that stratigraphically these Mississippian limestones uh, have such good permeability on a geologic time scale that they're communicating somewhere with the surface. So you get over pressures above, that gas and oil generation, but and that's probably a good segue into Kate's talk.